All right, my name's Stephen. For those of you who don't know me, uh, lead pastor here. We're kicking off a brand new series. This is our summer series. We'll be in it uh, until all of you in the second row here go back to school. And uh, it's called Exceedingly Righteous. Exceedingly Righteous. Now, the connotations of this word righteous um, are vast. And, and many of us have probably found ourselves in a culture at some point or another, if you've grown up in church, where this idea of the righteousness of the scribes or the Pharisees has messed with you a little bit. For instance, if you've ever thought to yourself, uh, I can't wear that to church, I have to wear this. And so you put on the suit and tie. Or if you ever ask yourself or somebody else the question, do I have to tithe on birthday money? And then you know what this is about. If you're over the age of 13 and you wondered, is it a sin to watch a PG-13 movie? Then you know what this is about. What we're going to do is look at this passage of Scripture. Maybe one of Jesus' uh, more misunderstood teachings. It's also been highly abused. Highly abused to create a culture, a religious culture, uh, where people are crushed under the weight of expectation of what it means to be righteous, of what it means to follow God, to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. On the other hand, at times this text has been used to create a license, a freedom to do whatever we want uh, without idea of rebellion or, or consequence. And so what is the proper understanding of this text? Now this text serves as a setup to a... Um, teaching that Jesus is going to get into. This is a part of, at the beginning, of a teaching that is most commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, perhaps Jesus' most famous sermon, or at least the, uh, and the longest sermon, as recorded in our New Testament. And after Jesus teaches on this, he goes into a series of topics or ideas that we'll look at throughout the summer. Now, if you've ever had a teacher, a boss, any authority figure who seemed to place over you um, expectations that were unbearable or a standard that seemed impossible to achieve. Well, then you understand the dynamic to which Jesus is speaking to this morning. Maybe you grew up at a school or a house, a work environment where every little thing was scrutinized. Every bit of it. And every time it did, it felt like the weight of expectation was on you and you could never live up to the standard. And perhaps you've carried that idea or mindset into your understanding of the gospel. And now you carry that with you in your faith. And uh, perhaps you've had a season where you tried your absolute best to live up to every single one of them, to be the perfect churchgoer. Only if you're anything like me to not meet it and to wonder what's next. And so perhaps you hear this phrase, your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees and think, but how? How is that even possible? I mean, that phrase alone, uh, to, to modernize it, would be like saying your athleticism must exceed that of LeBron. Your wealth must exceed that of Jeff Bezos. Your singing abilities must exceed that of Britney Spears. Obviously impossible standards. <laughs> what does it mean to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees? Because the stakes are high. It says if you don't, you will never enter into the kingdom. You don't get in. We're left on the outside. Unless our righteousness exceeds that of these guys. Let's see how Jesus got there. Starts in verse 17, says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Now, when Jesus uses the term law, he's referring to the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, over 600 laws were written into, uh, into these books, and what they uh, were written into for was to display the will of God and to teach both the individual and the community how to live and operate uh, together. And so it would teach the individual how to live a life of godliness, and it would teach the community how to operate operate together to reflect the glory of God. 
And he says to the scribes and the Pharisees, don't think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. Uh, We could, I think it's fair to say, Jesus is saying from our context, don't think I've come to get rid of the Old Testament. That's not why I came. Now he's going to use two words, and they're really important that we understand these two words. He says, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now to the original Jewish uh, listener, when they heard these words abolish and fulfill, they wouldn't think about it necessarily the way we do, where we think abolish means to destroy and fulfill means to make better. Uh, They would think of it more of this way. I have not come to misinterpret the Old Testament. I have come to properly interpret it for you. In other words, I have come so that you might understand what the law in the Old Testament was really all about. That you might fully understand it. That you would see that what the Old Testament is not about is a crushing standard that will destroy you. That the Old Testament is not about a law that you will have to strive after. It's about something different. Now, for the individuals that Jesus is talking to, there are going to be two groups, the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes were known as the great interpreters of the law. The Pharisees were known as the great performers of the law. And not just the law, the Torah, but what they had actually done is they had taken the Torah and some really smart guys had um, made a commentary on it called the Mishnah. And then some other smart guys made a commentary on the Mishnah, which was a commentary on the Torah called the Talmud. And what the scribes and the Pharisees would do is not just live up to the Torah, but they would live up to the Torah and the commentary on the Torah, the Mishnah, and the commentary on the Mishnah, the Talmud. And so whereas God said this, now that had become this. For instance, I'm making this up. If God said, I'm not making that part up, I'm making up what I'm about to say. If God had said, you should have nice hair, then what the Mishnah would say is nice hair means if you're a male, it doesn't come lower than your ears. God was pro-fade, okay? Now, the other guys would come along, that's actually kind of funny. Okay, now, the other, the other guys would come along and they would say, well, not only did he mean that, he also meant it can't, um, it has to be parted to this side. And so the Pharisees and the scribes would say, God said you have to have nice hair. That means you have to part it to the side and fade. And then they'd say, well, no, I thought he just said you had to have nice hair. But they did this 612 times. And it created this standard that was unbearable. And you know what's sad? We often do this in our own way. We often do this in our own way in our understanding of Christianity. We do it in our own way in our Christian organizations. We do it in our own way in the church. We don't call it the mission on the Talmud. We call it tradition. We call it denomination. We call it a bunch of things. And what has it become? An unbearable weight that crushes us. A standard that we try to live up to. A culture that we try to fit into. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I didn't come to, I didn't come so that you would misunderstand the Old Testament. I came so that you would properly understand it. That you would get what it was really about. It says, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, another way of saying for all of time, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law, Until all is accomplished. In other words, what he's saying is every little bit of the Old Testament, every little bit of the Torah and every little bit of the Old Testament, all of it, from Genesis to Malachi, all of it, every little bit of it is important. And here's why it's important. It's important because it teaches you as the individual how to live a life of godliness. If you properly understand it. But it also teaches something else. It doesn't just teach how the individual lives a life of godliness. It also teaches how the community creates a community that reflects the kingdom and the community of the Trinitarian God. It's individual and it's corporate. Now, in an individualistic society, we love the idea of an individual standard. Oftentimes, we rebel against things that are communal. 
But the law was set up not to just be individual. It was set up so that the children of God, the Israelites, might understand how the community was supposed to interact. In fact, great studies have been done that the, um, the, the reason the tithe was written in the way that it was written in the tithe is 10% was a matter of the human heart. But you know what it also was? A way to ensure that there was no one in need. It wasn't just about the individual. It was about taking care of every member of the community. And so he says, don't get rid of any of it. Because if you see how it's all properly understood and interpreted, if you get that, oh, then it's good for the individual and it's good for the community. It'll teach you a heart of godliness. You can't study this text and your mind not go to another text. Another text later, Jesus is asked, hey, what are the most important commandments? Since you, Mr. Jesus, didn't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them, tell me which ones are most important. And what does Jesus say? Well, I'll sum them up for you, Jesus says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love me in such a way that reflects that you love me as an individual. But he doesn't stop there. What does he say next? Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, okay, I'll sum up all of the commandments. I will sum them all up for you. I'll teach you how to properly understand them. You love me with everything you are, and you live in such a way that produces the community that I desire. It's both. It's both. He says, so don't get rid of any of it. Because if you do, you won't know how to love me the way you ought to. And if you do, the community will not be what I desire it to be. Deuteronomy 17, 16 through 17, this is a part of the Torah, the original law written in. God says this, Only he, whoever he is, must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt. Whenever Egypt is referenced in the Old Testament, uh, it's supposed to, it's a real place, obviously, but it's also supposed to symbolize the place of slavery. He says, Or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself, himself excessive silver and gold. And so here you have this Old Testament passage. God is writing the law. And he says, don't go after these three things. Horses, many wives, and wealth. Now, on the outside, we could look in and we could say, okay, that means I can't have more than X amount of horses. I don't know what many is. Can't have more than that. Got to stay underneath that so I can have my righteousness. Okay, he says, don't acquire many wives. Um, the rest of the Bible gives us a hint. One is great, okay? Um, and then he also says, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold, right? That is obviously left up to interpretation as well on what excessive is. So that would be the righteousness exceeding that of the Pharisees. All you have to do is define many twice and excessive once and then live underneath that and you're good. But what's going on here? We'll see it later in a passage. But what we see here is God is teaching the law on one hand saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, because it's, it's not good for you. But underneath, why do we acquire horses? Why did they acquire horses? We acquire horses for a different reason, obviously. Why did they? It was power. It was power. And what's he saying? He's saying, don't go back to Egypt. Don't go back to Egypt to, to get power. Don't go step back into your slavery, into outside of the kingdom, and search for your significance with power. And he says, don't, don't, don't acquire many wives. He says, don't go back to Egypt seeking for acceptance and pleasure. Then he says, don't acquire excessive gold. Don't go back to Egypt and look for your riches and your wealth as your identity and your security. It's on the outside. On the outside, all it is is a list of things not to do, but underneath it. And this is what Jesus says when I'm telling you, I've come so that you might fully understand what I was saying back there. It's not that God doesn't want you to have a stable. He doesn't want you searching for power. 
So he says, don't get rid of any of it. It's all important. Now this guy comes along. It's famous, named Solomon. Look at Solomon. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh. Where's the daughter of Pharaoh from? Egypt. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, now quoting Deuteronomy, you shall not enter marriage with them. Neither shall they with you, for surely they will, what? Turn your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses. I'm sure they all felt that way. And 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after their gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God. In other words, he didn't love the Lord his God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. As was the heart of David his father. What happened? He ignored God. He got rid of one little dot. The word not. (laughs) And the law said, don't acquire these things. And he just went and acquired these things. I mean, you have Solomon who what? Had the greatest military, all the horses. Solomon who had the most wives. Solomon who had an excessive, an excessive amount of gold and riches. And what did it do? It turned his heart. Turned his heart. He didn't obey the law. And he couldn't live up to it. His heart was turned. Ah, but see what it does next. As the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. What else does it do? Destroys the community. Destroyed him. His heart turned away from God. Ripped up the kingdom. The Old Testament kingdom of the Israelites is a reflection of the New Testament kingdom of the church and the kingdom of God. What do we learn here? That our sin affects us? And it affects our community. That's what we see here. Why? Because he ignored one part of the law. Jesus goes on now in verse 19. He says, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments, whoever relaxes just one of them. And by the way, when it says one of the least, that means that there was like this little pecking order that was going on, right? They had their major laws and their minor laws. But he says, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, don't change it. Understand it. So then what do we do? What do we do? He says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness, your holiness, exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Could you imagine the listeners after hearing all of this going, ha! Yeah, but that's impossible. That's impossible. In order to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, of course, we must, again, understand the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees so we can have one that exceeds theirs. Otherwise, we don't get in. I want in. What was the righteousness of the Pharisees? Oh, it was an unbelievable external obedience. Unbelievable. They did tithe their birthday money. They always wore a suit to church. They didn't watch PG-13 movies. They only listened to K-Love. Oh. Oh, How much of us have gotten caught up into this as well? To try and do these things, to have this external righteousness, this performance righteousness. Righteousness. 
And to say, ah, if it is good enough, it exceeds it. If it exceeds it. I mean, Jesus isn't speaking in riddle. He does say, you have to have a righteousness that is greater than theirs. Which either means, Jesus means that you and I have to muster self-discipline and control that is in a way greater than what they were able to do. Or there has to be something different. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. So what righteousness? What righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees? See, even in Jesus' own conversation that he has with these scribes and Pharisees at different times, Jesus gets into these disputes over the law and the interpretation of the law and how that law should play out. But every time Jesus gets into an argument with the scribes and the Pharisees, he's giving us a hint of what he means by a greater righteousness. Because when the scribes and the Pharisees begin to talk about the performance and the behavior and what you're supposed to do out here, every time they get into that argument, Jesus takes it from there to the heart. He says, no, 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 no. You're abolishing it. You're abolishing it. You're misinterpreting it. In one case, he says, Sabbath is for the man, not man for the Sabbath. You're abolishing it. Let me fulfill it. Let me interpret it for you. Let me tell you about the greater righteousness. Now here, here's where it gets interesting. Because at times what people have said is, great, then I will throw off all the rules and I'll throw off all the laws and, and this is so much easier. This is so much easier. But it's not. Oh, it's actually way harder. Sorry. It's way harder. Because over here, let's just take the tithe as an example. Since I brought it up a couple of times, Jesus says, when you should tithe or when you tithe, you know, don't do it like this, don't do it like this, right, right. And so you have this idea of the tithe. And, and if you're a good scribe and a good Pharisee, you have figured out exactly how you're supposed to tithe and when you're supposed to tithe and what the tithe looks like and all of that. And if you administrate your life well enough and you have a good enough Excel document and all of these types of things, then you can do it. You can do it. And in fact, you can make it easy. But then Jesus says, let me teach you about the greater righteousness. The greater righteousness doesn't look at the Excel document and say, am I tithing? No, no, no. The greater righteousness is this. Oh, but have I gone back to Egypt? Am I looking at my money as a source of power, comfort, security, strength, love, acceptance, purpose? Am I looking at it like that? It doesn't matter what I'm doing on the outside. Am I using it in that way? The greater righteousness then says, it doesn't matter what I'm doing over here. What's going on in here? Oh, but it doesn't even stop there. It's even worse. It's even worse. Because what happens next? You go, oh, well, and am I leveraging all that I have for the good of my community? It didn't stop, <laughs> right? The, the Pharisee is at one level. And they're like, look, I'm tithing on everything. And then, and, then, and then sometimes we get to this place and we said, okay, okay, I get that. I'm doing that. Sure, that's great. That's good. That's good. Ah, yes, and I'm not finding my power and my wealth and my security and all of that. I'm not finding it in my money. That's good. That's good. But the gospel bearer goes another step further and says, okay, but now do I look at everything that I have? everything that I've acquired and ask myself, how do I love my neighbor as myself with it? Oh, it's one further step. And that's way, way harder than cutting a check. That gets deep. That gets deep. Money, one thing. Jesus I don't even think we're going to hit that over the summer. Jesus takes a whole bunch of topics. A whole bunch, and he just keeps going. Listen, this, this series is heart surgery. And it's brutal. I mean, it's just brutal. I'm just going to tell you at the beginning. Because what was Jesus doing in this teaching? He was saying, this is my kingdom. Do you want it? <laughs>
Do you want to be in it? And what's the warning that he's giving at the beginning? If you hear these teachings and you don't heed them, then you're not in. That's what he says. That's what he says. Now here's what he's not saying. He's not saying if your performance isn't good enough, then you're not in. That's not what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. He's saying those who are in, this is how their heart begins to operate in the kingdom. Oh, and it's brutal. But what does it produce? What does it produce? What was the point of the law? A life of godliness. A life of godliness. The end result isn't brutal. The process is. The end result is a life of godliness. The end result is a community that reflects the nature of God on this earth. The end result is the church that Jesus came to plant. The end result is you with a heart transformed, the old gone and the new come. The end result is you totally free from the law, but completely surrendered to the king. That's the end result. And the end result is a community that loves their neighbor as themselves, that reflects beautifully the Trinitarian communion community we see in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. So that's our journey this summer. That's our journey. That our hearts would not be turned like Solomon's, but that they would be melted. They would be melted. Melted by what? By properly understanding the Old Testament. Or properly understanding that every time the law was given and every time the law was rebelled against, that there was a payment for that rebellion. And in the Old Testament, it was a sacrifice of a pure spotless lamb. And the sacrifice covered the rebellion. And Jesus shows up later and says, let me teach you the fulfillment of this law. Let me teach you the fulfillment. Sin still must be paid for but I will pay it. I will be crushed under the law so that you don't have to be crushed by it. And what ought that to do? It ought to melt our hearts. Instead of turning them, we, we should be melted by his love. And then when we are, we open ourselves up and we hear his teaching and we're changed by it. And that's my hope and prayer for you this summer.